I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum. Charlotte, this uh, new Merc design is probably some <laughs> of my favorite work you have ever done. Oh my god. It's honestly one of my <laughs> favorites I've ever done, so I'm glad <laughs> everyone seems to be enjoying it. There's oh, been a lot of great goodness. feedback so far. If oh you haven't seen our new Mothman design, he's freaking glorious, you guys. Yes, oh I'm uh, not to toot my own horn or pat my own back, but I am quite proud of him. He's, uh, if you haven't seen him yet, go to our social media, go check him out. Um, he's up on our thread list as well, and I'm in the works of getting some stickers ordered for our etsy but i have uh some other cryptids of the same style that old school felix the cat style i have some in mind so hopefully i have some time to get those out for you guys too i am so stoked for this little merc series like (laughs) cartoon cryptids yes please oh i love it um, we would also like to thank you for all the love on our strange reappearances episode last week. We've heard from a few of you that you'd like to see that topic kind of brought back in as a series and hell yeah. Yeah, honest, I wasn't sure how people were going to feel about it. I wasn't sure how that one was going to do, but we have gotten so much feedback for that one. Just people saying that they're like super into that topic. They love the episode and I'm I'm down. Mm, Yeah, like we'd absolutely love to cover more stories like that. So if you have a strange reappearance that you'd like us to cover, you can absolutely send it our way. Yes, we actually have a channel for that kind of stuff in our Patreon Discord, but we do take note of all the suggestions you guys sent in. Yeah, and you can always email us at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com as well. All right, enough of that. Uh, Yes, so this isn't quite like our normal content, But we have one hell of a story to cover today. Get ready to get real sad. Yeah, it's a sad one, you guys. Dear listeners, today we are covering the murder of Diane Fossey. Diane was a conservationist and primatologist. She is best known for writing the book Gorillas in the Mist. She spent 13 years following eight families of gorillas throughout the remote Rwandan wilderness. Diane greatly opposed tourism and poaching, both things that were putting the gorillas at risk. She was found murdered in her cabin after tensions between her and her enemies escalated to an all-time high. And to this day, it really doesn't seem like people can agree on who it actually was that killed her. We cover death on a very regular basis here, but just a heads up to all of you that we are going to be talking a lot about animal death today. I uh, I know that hits differently, so just a very fair yes. warning. Yes, trigger warning there. Diane Fossey may not be as well known as Jane Goodall, which is one of the reasons I wanted to cover this story. It's such a sad one, and it really strikes a chord with me because anyone who knows me knows I love animals. I think if this story so far is ringing any bells for folks, it's because of the movie. That's where I knew this story from. Yeah, Sigourney Weaver plays her in the movie adaptation of Gorillas in the Mist, so that's a pretty fun little tidbit. And it it is a pretty great movie if you haven't seen it. I strongly recommend. Have you ever seen a gorilla in real life? I don't think so, to be honest with you. I, I, I haven't been to too many zoos before, and that's really the only place I would have seen them so far, and I don't think I've seen one. I saw gorillas at the Calgary Zoo. Oh, I haven't been to the Calgary Zoo. Yeah, there's like an area where they come out with like the trainers or whatever. And they tell you like, don't make eye contact with them ever, 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 because they'll get really mad and they'll like. Yeah, they're powerful they're, animals. They're scary. They're really big. I would not want to fuck with a gorilla. Absolutely not. Okay, so let's get into it. Diane Fossey was born in San Francisco in 1932. From a very young age, her parents Hazel and Edward Fossey III noticed that she had a love for all animals. It all started when her parents got her a pet goldfish. She was quite insecure and shy, and she formed a significant bond with the little fish. She struggled to make friends with other children and seemed to enjoy the company of animals over humans. I can relate to that so much. Oh, me too. Diane's parents signed her up for horseback riding lessons when she was six. It was also around that time that her parents turned her world upside down by telling her they no longer wanted to be married and that they were divorcing. 
Nothing like, hey, kiddo, here's a pony. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. That's basically what they did. Oh, that doesn't, like, like, that's not ripping the Band-Aid off, you know? Like, that's not gonna help. Oh, my God. I will say, though, as the uh, now adult child of divorced parents, I would have been happy with a pony. (laughs) (laughs) I, you know what? I think if you ask a lot of adult children of divorced parents, they would tell you they wish their parents had divorced sooner. (laughs) (laughs) So there's always that. Our depressing episode is just getting more depressing. (laughs) Oh my god. Off to a good start. Fantastic. All right. Her mother remarried a year later, and her new husband, a man named Richard Price, was by all accounts absolutely terrible to little Diane. This guy sounds like a real piece of work. Apparently, he wouldn't even let her sit at the table with them for dinner. He very obviously treated her like a stepchild and showed her very little love. Her father tried to stay in contact, but Hazel opposed it, and eventually they lost touch. Maybe this is just me being really shady. Could you not have fought a little harder to stay in touch, you know? Right? And here's the interesting thing about her parents is they were very different. Like, her mom was a model in the 30s, and her dad was this, like, real estate agent slash, like, businessman kind of guy. So they were definitely well off then. Oh, absolutely. And Richard Price, obviously, he was also well off. But her dad actually married two other times and had, like, different families every time. So So there was was a bit of a mess going on in this uh, stretch uh, household. After high school, Diane enrolled in a business course at Marin Junior College. It was clear to her that this wasn't something she was passionate about, but her stepfather encouraged her to go that route, and she really wanted to make her family happy. Her first year of school went relatively well, but Diane felt as if she missed horseback riding, and she decided to get a summer job at a ranch in Montana. During that time, she began to rethink the direction that her life was taking. When she returned home, she enrolled in a pre-veterinary course. This greatly upset her parents, especially her stepfather. She would support herself during that time by working various jobs in retail, labs, and factories. She failed her second year of college, but would receive her bachelor's degree in 1954. And can I just say, good job. Like, I'm really glad you realized, like, hey, this business thing is not for me. I'm not interested in it. I'm going to go do what I think I'm going to be passionate about. I love that. Right. And it was one of those things where her parents were like, if you go to business school, we'll fund it. If you don't, you're on your own, kid. And she was like, all right. All right, bet. Yeah, I I got this. And Mm -hmm. you know what? Maybe it took her a little longer because she failed her second year, but she fucking kept at it and finished anyway. So it's a badass. Yeah, absolutely it is. During the early part of her career, she worked in a hospital as an occupational therapist. And we do just want to clarify that for the first part of her career, she worked with humans. She actually worked with tuberculosis patients. Her skills with horses won her many awards around this time, and she was becoming well-known around the equestrian scene. In 1955, she would relocate to Kentucky to further pursue this. To support herself during this time, she worked with children in a Kentucky hospital. She was shy and quiet, but the kids absolutely loved her. She became close friends with a co-worker named Mary White Henry. The Henry family invited her to live out on their family farm where she began working with their horses. Being around such a tight-knit family full of so much love was something that she had been missing her entire life. She was incredibly happy during this time, but she wanted to see more of the world. A friend of hers returned from a trip to Africa, and after hearing about it, Diane promised herself that she would do anything to make that happen for herself. The Henry family also visited Africa and actually invited Diane to join them. However, she wasn't able to afford it. She ended up taking out a loan from the bank for $8,000, which was about what she made in a year. So, like, not, not a small amount of money. No. She combined that with all the money she had saved up and booked a seven-week trip to Kenya, Tanzania, the Congo, and Zimbabwe. One of the things that she was looking forward to the most was visiting the Tsavo National Park, which is famous for its wildlife. 
Her guide, a British hunter named John Alexander, took her to Olduvai Gorge where she met Dr. Lewis Leakey. Dr. Leakey introduced her to the work of Jane Goodall, which was still in its very early stages. He stressed to her the importance that long-term field studies with great apes would serve in the future. She spent some time exploring the archaeological sites around the gorge. She heard about Joan and Alan Root, two wildlife photographers who were collecting photos of the gorillas. She became determined to meet with them. Unfortunately, she slipped and fell while exploring one of the sites and broke her ankle. This only made her even more determined, and eventually she made her way to the Congo, where Roots allowed her to camp behind their cabin in the mountains. After a few days, they took her into the forest to look for gorillas. Diane assisted with photographing them and was able to spend her time observing them. She describes this experience in Gorillas in the Mist by saying, It was their individuality combined with the shyness of their behavior that remained the most captivating impression of this first encounter with the greatest of the great apes. I left Kavara with reluctance, but never with a doubt that I would somehow return to learn more about the gorillas of the Misted Mountains. When she returned to Kentucky, she resumed working at the Children's Hospital to pay off the loan she had taken out. She also worked towards getting her photos published, along with some articles that she had written regarding her trip. In 1966, Dr. Lewis Leakey and Diane would be reunited when he visited Louisville, Kentucky for part of his lecture tour. Apparently, he was a pretty big deal and drew quite the crowd. Diane waited amongst the other Leakey admirers for her turn to speak with him and show him what she had been up to. When he saw her work, he was very impressed. He convinced her to head a long-term field project where she would study the gorillas further herself. This was three years after her original trip to Africa. The idea was that she would essentially do what Jane Goodall had done, but with the gorillas. Diane quit her job and worked with Dr. Leakey to secure funding for the study. During the eight months that it took her to secure the funding and get approved for a work visa, she studied Swahili and attended various primatology classes as an auditor. She arrived in Nairobi in December of 1966 and was given an old Land Rover, which she affectionately nicknamed Lily. I love that fact. That's amazing. Right? I'm all for naming your car. You should name your car when you get one. 100%. You should. Mm-hmm. And actually, another super fun fact, uh, during her travels, she stopped at the Gombe Stream Research Center, where she actually met with Jane Goodall herself, who showed her some of the research methods when it came to her chimpanzees. Photographer Alan Root acted as a guide during her trip from Kenya to the Congo. He was familiar with the area and helped her secure all the necessary permits for her trip. He hired two men who would stay with her at the camp and assist with her studies, as well as a few other men who would help carry her gear into the isolated Kibera Meadow. After Alan Root left, Diane began tracking the gorillas. She was actually able to spot a single male gorilla within the first 10 minutes of her trek, which is a huge deal. She hadn't expected to see a gorilla for days. The male saw her and went back into the bushes. Diane took this as a sign. Eventually, an experienced gorilla tracker named Sanwekwi joined her team. Sanwekwi had worked with the Roots in 1963 and was incredibly skilled at tracking. Having him on board would prove to be a huge advantage. If this sounds like some glorious trip, an amazing time, it really wasn't. Living out in the African wilderness was incredibly difficult. Diane slept in a 7 by 10 foot tent, which also served as her office and her bathroom. The area that they were in was incredibly wet and a part of the tent had to be dedicated to drying her clothes. According to her reports, she was constantly soaked. Bugs were also a massive issue. I think about how much I hate being annoyed by a few mosquitoes during the summer and I automatically think I just straight up couldn't survive this. Like, I'm such a wuss. (laughs) Um, we haven't had like really bad mosquitoes here for a couple of years, at least where I live. And this year they've just gotten specifically bad and it's already like making my skin crawl. I hate camp. We've talked about this many, many times. You guys know I fucking hate camping, (laughs) even under the most prime conditions. So this like being in the jungle would break me. I just pure misery. 
They also lived off of mostly tinned food and potatoes. And once a month, Diane would hike all the way back to Lily down the mountain and drive four hours total just to restock their supplies. She must have been incredibly fit. Like, she is hiking all over the place, spending all this time outside, probably hauling a lot of gear. Amazing. Oh, yeah, like she's going up and down a mountain here. Mm-hmm. Sanwekwi taught Diane how to properly track the gorillas, and eventually the two were able to identify two separate families in the area along Mount McKenno. Diane learned the importance of not pushing the gorillas and accepting their boundaries. In Gorillas in the Mist, she spoke about this saying, The Kabara groups taught me much regarding gorilla behavior. From them, I learned to accept the animals on their own terms and never to push them beyond the varying levels of tolerance that they were willing to give. Any observer is an intruder in the domain of a wild animal and must remember that the right of the animal supersedes human interests. The gorillas were very reluctant to have her round at first, even from a distance. She slowly earned their trust by mimicking their behavior. She would actually imitate the sounds that they made and allowed them to see her eating the same plants that they liked. She was able to differentiate the gorillas by their individual nose prints. She would sketch them and eventually separate them. Her studies were going well, but the political situation in the Congo was quickly worsening. Rebellions and full-on battles were happening in the province she was in, and soon everything she worked on was at risk. However, Diane was adamant to stay as long as possible. On July 9, 1967, soldiers showed up at her camp to escort her to safety before fighting broke out in the mountains. Diane spent two weeks under military guard in Rumangabo. On July 26, she was able to escape thanks to good old-fashioned bribery. She offered her guards cash to take her to Kisoro, Uganda to register Lily. Once there, Diane visited the Traveler's Rest Hotel in Kisoro. She was questioned and warned not to return to the Congo. She then flew back to Nairobi in Kenya to meet with Dr. Leakey, and the two decided that Diane would continue her work, this time on the other side of the mountain in Rwanda. She wrote about her first impression of the Virunga Mountains, saying, The sense of exhilaration I felt when viewing the heartland of the Virungas for the first time from those distant heights is as vivid now as though it had only occurred a short time ago. I have made my home among the mountain gorillas. Shortly after arriving in Rwanda, Diane met fellow American Rosamond Carr, who had been living in the area for a number of years. She introduced her to Aliette de Monk, who had lived in the Congo for most of her life, up until the most recent political unrest. Aliette was very familiar with the area and helped Diane find a new site for her study. Diane was devastated to see that a huge amount of the area had been destroyed to make room for cattle, Much of it was also very obviously being frequented by poachers. It took two weeks until Diane found a suitable location. On September 24th, 1967, Diane Fossey founded the Karisoki Research Center, a center which would eventually become a world-renowned research station. Diane was faced with new challenges here. For one, Diane spoke Swahili, and the men she hired spoke Kinyarwanda. She was forced to communicate with her team just using hand gestures and facial expressions. She used similar tactics with this new group of gorillas that she had in the past, and eventually this earned the trust of four different gorilla groups. In 1968, the National Geographic Society sent Bob Campbell to photograph her studies. At first, Diane didn't really want him there and thought that he would just get in the way. However, the two quickly became friends and his work would spread awareness of what she was doing. This drew international attention to her and she became somewhat of a celebrity. Because she didn't have any scientific education, Diane enrolled in the Department of Animal Behavior in Cambridge. She would travel between there and Rwanda until she finished her PhD in 1974. This allowed her to earn the respect of her peers and also secure further funding for her studies. Overall, things were going well. Not only was the world acknowledging her work, Diane was finally earning the trust of the gorillas. This made her desire to protect them grow even further. She would fight off the poachers using some unconventional methods. This involved burning their snares and even wearing masks to scare them away. 
Along with that, she would often confront them directly, something that very quickly made her many enemies. She would call her methods active conservation and was convinced that if she didn't do anything about this problem now, there would be nothing left to observe. This led her to burning down known poachers' houses and even ordering her entire crew to carry guns and shoot on sight. According to later reports by a former associate of hers, she would go as far as to kidnap her enemies and have her team torture them. She also used the locals' fears of witches and magic to scare them away from her cabin. I feel like this has escalated very quickly. (laughs) Oh my god, seriously, it really does. Like, it's you really see her get desperate here because she's attached to these gorillas and she knows, like, if I don't do something, no one will. Yeah, and you know what? Perhaps torturing them was a bridge too far, but I can appreciate that she's like, no, I'm going to fucking do whatever it takes to make these gorillas live. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, unconventional methods, but all of this would make her a whole bunch of enemies with some of the locals who were just people who were just trying to live their lives. Diane used her own money to help equip park wardens against poachers so that laws could be better enforced. This led to the first anti-poaching patrol groups. Oh my goodness, say that five times fast. (laughs) Their sole purpose would be to protect the animals in that area. Tensions continued to escalate. During all of this, Diane continued to become quite close with some of the gorillas. One of them, she affectionately named Digit due to the fact that he had a broken finger. Digit was around five years old and had no other gorillas his age nearby. He became curious about Diane, and the two actually were able to come what she considered close friends. He would visit her all the time and clean her, and they would play, eat, and just hang out. There's a bunch of pictures of this, and honestly, it's pretty amazing to see it. Unfortunately, on December 31st, 1977, tragedy struck. Digit's group of gorillas was attacked by poachers. Digit fought bravely in an attempt to protect his family, but was sadly killed. This allowed many of the other gorillas to escape. His hands and his head were severed and the poachers left. Eventually, more of the gorillas that she was close with succumbed to the same fate. This absolutely shattered Diane, and she became even more desperate to protect the gorillas. Digit was a huge part of her shoot with Bob Campbell, and when the public found out about this death, many people wanted to help. Diane established the Digit Fund to raise money for conservation and anti-poaching initiatives. Diane relocated to New York, where she served as a visiting professor at Cornell University. It was during this time that she began to work on Gorillas in the Mist, which she then published in 1983. She arrived back in Rwanda in December of 1985. The situation at the camp was incredibly tumultuous, and many of the people there had long since left for their own safety. Despite this, Diane decided to stay. What happened exactly is to this day still unknown. On the morning of December 27th, 1985, Diane Fossey was found murdered in her cabin. She had been struck in the face and the head with a machete. The cabin had been broken into, but nothing was stolen. It was clearly a targeted attack. Diane was buried behind the cabin at Karasoke with the gorillas that had been killed. She was laid to rest next to Digit. Isn't that, like, that kills me. It's, it it busts my ass that she was just trying to help these animals, you know, and people were like, yeah, she's too much of a problem, can't have this. And and that was it. And I mean, the, I think the fact that they buried her with Digit, I think that's really sweet. I feel um, like it's very poetic. It's I, I suppose it's a poetic kind of ending to a very sad and tragic story. It, it's definitely, I feel like, probably what she would have wanted. Oh, I think so. We actually still don't know who killed her. And obviously there were a ton of suspects right off the bat. Her entire staff was arrested after her murder, but they were all slowly released one by one due to just lack of evidence. One of the men who was cleared was researcher Wayne McGuire. However, he was suddenly charged to everyone's surprise for the murder. Unfortunately, he was tipped off beforehand and he fled the country. Rwanda and the U.S. do not extradite criminals to one another, so he was allowed to remain in America as a free man. 
Because of this, many people believed he was just used as a scapegoat. And if that's truly the case and he is not guilty of this, he got off incredibly lucky, I think. Oh, yeah, because they were basically like, he can return, but he doesn't have to. But they told him like the penalty for him would have been death by firing squad. Brutal. I wouldn't go back. No, absolutely not. I'd be like, you know what? We're just going to check that country off the list. Uh, We don't need to go there anymore. (laughs) <laughs> yep, exactly. He would remain in the States, but would miss out on various jobs due to his connections to the case. Another potential suspect, and I am doing my best here, Emmanuel Ruelicana. Diane had recently fired him, and he responded by allegedly trying to kill her with a machete. He was later found dead in his prison cell. He had taken his own life by hanging himself. In 2001, a man infamously known as Monsieur Zed who was tied to the Rwandan genocide, was accused of ordering her death, but this was never confirmed. At the end of the day, we still don't know who killed Diane Fossey. It could have been one of the men we mentioned or any one of her numerous enemies. It was revealed that hair was found clenched in her hand when her body was discovered and that later lab tests revealed that it belonged to a white man. An autopsy was never performed due to the fact that there were no coroners present in all of Rwanda. Perhaps someday we'll find out who her murderer was, but Diane Fossey's legacy continues to live on. The Digit Fund was renamed the Diane Fossey Guerrilla Fund International. This is such a sad story, you guys. Oh, oh my so God. tragic. Oh, it's rough. Did you know about the whole Ellen DeGeneres, Diane Fossey thing? I did not. This is news to me. Okay. I'll openly admit, not the biggest Ellen DeGeneres fan. I'm not going to lie. Me either. She hasn't had a good few years. Anyways, um, for one of her birthdays, her wife surprised her by... Okay, so Diane Fossey is, I guess, one of her heroes. And her wife surprised her by having a wing of the research center built in Ellen DeGeneres's name and they launched a fund for her a charity in her name for Diane Fossey okay which I thought was kind of interesting and I remember seeing that and I was like I wonder if they're ever they're ever actually gonna build like a center there and apparently they have and it gets used and uh there is a lot of education that still happens the actual cabin and everything that was all torn down and it was lost but there's like a big center in her memory and students come from all around the world and it's it's pretty amazing like it, it's at least something came out of all of this yeah as much as her life was cut very much short she has 100 percent left a legacy behind that it's going to be remembered for a very long time but uh yeah like we kind of said at the beginning this is different than our regular kind of subject matter but still a very grim very sad story and uh, definitely one that we thought was worth sharing Yeah, very interesting and still very much true crime, obviously. I am sadder than I was when we started recording, so... That's okay, we're recording fairly late in the evening, so now we can just go relax and go to bed. (laughs) Yeah, this is embarrassing, but we are recording this at, uh, it is now 9.31pm, and it's pretty much both of our bedtimes. (laughs) Yeah, so we're going to wrap this up real quick um, just by saying (laughs) thank you all so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to get more of us, we have our second podcast, Extra Credit, where it's a little more candid. Um, We kind of bring some different topics to the table and we kind of have more of a laugh than we do during our usual uh, episodes. I have so much fun recording that show with you. So do I. And I love editing. I'm, I always find myself, this is maybe sounds super narcissistic, but I find myself like chuckling along. I'm like, haha, very funny. <laughs> We're freaking funny, man. I'll take it. I'm, I'm uh, fine with that. Uh, um, and it comes out every second Wednesday also. Yes, it does. So check it out if you haven't already. There's a whole bunch of episodes out for you to enjoy. And uh, I think you'll like it. Hell yeah. It is that time of the week. Once again, it's time to thank our beautiful, wonderful, amazing, phenomenal, grim VIPs and up. So we would like to give a huge thank you to Mayhem, Mudkip, Kevin, Judy, Hillary, Brian, Atlantean Jedi, 
Pink Flamingo 20, Lisa, and Bob. Y'all are the titty city. Thank you so much for your support. Seriously, like any and all support that we get, it means so, so, so much to us. It's still, you know, we've been doing this for a while. This is episode 68 and it still blows my mind. Like people listen to us. (laughs) It's pretty wild. If you aren't listening to this on the Saturday it released, please come check out our Saturday releases on YouTube. We do a live premiere every Saturday, noon, Man- Mountain Standard Time, and uh, we have a live discussion about the case, and we love seeing you guys in there. It's a good time. I love just talking about everything with everyone. I just love talking about true crime, obviously. So getting <laughs> to do that with our listeners is just, like it's so much fun. Yeah, we get a lot of interesting theories and opinions and even stuff that we like missed or we, you know, like we talk about stuff. It's great. It's wonderful. Come check it out. Yeah. And we have a bunch of new features that we unlocked because we are uh, on the road to becoming monetized on YouTube. Well, I guess we are now. Um, So you can do all sorts of cool stuff in the chat. Yeah, I'm even discovering it because I'm such a boomer when it comes to this sort of stuff. So we are all discovering it together. (laughs) Yep, definitely. All right, everyone. Thank you so, so, so much for listening. This has been The The Grim Grim Curriculum. So Dita, I did some horrible histories uh, facts lately. And this one comes from the 27th of May, 1541. Mm-hmm. The Countess of Salisbury was executed by beheading, but apparently the executioner wasn't very good at his job because it took 11 blows before they finally got her head off. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> That's a bad day at work. It is a bad day for everybody involved in that one. Bye. Bye.